morning from Washington, D.C. to our audience in the United States. Good afternoon to those of you in Europe and welcome to everyone around the world for this special edition of Atlantic Council Front Page or hashtag AC Front Page, our premier platform for global leaders with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. I'm deeply delighted to be joined at Atlantic Council headquarters on short notice by NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg ahead of the NATO summit next Monday and on his first trip to Washington since President Biden's inauguration and since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're also delighted to be back physically in our Washington offices, of course, according to local protocols, while still enjoying the luxury of the high-level global virtual audience we developed over the past months. This is likely now to be our hybrid reality. Mr. Secretary General, the Atlantic Council prides itself on being NATO's home in Washington. And as you know, our doors are open to you and the Alliance's leaders as you come here. And it is our 60th anniversary uh, this year of doing all of that work. And in that spirit, we're hosting this Wednesday, so just two days from now, General Todd Walters, the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, as part of our Commander Series. Mr. Secretary General, you helped launch AC Front Page last June when you unveiled your plans for a new period of reflection about the Alliance's mission and structure uh, over the next 10 years. We were heartened as you stressed the need to, quote, use NATO more politically, unquote, rather than just as a means of military cooperation, as important as that is. You said, quote, NATO is the only place that brings Europe and North America together every day. Ahead of your meeting with President Biden and with members of Congress, and with the NATO summit just a few days away, we look forward to hearing your vision for the future of the Alliance and your analysis of progress on the forward-looking NATO 2030 agenda that you introduced here last June. To our audience, thank you all for joining us from all over the world for this significant discussion. We're broadcasting live on Zoom as well on the Council's website, AC, uh, AtlanticCouncil.org, our website, and across social media platforms. I encourage all of you watching to ask your questions of the Secretary General using the Q&A function on Zoom and join the conversation on Twitter by using hashtag AC from page and hashtag NATO 2030. And now it's my pleasure to pass to Laura, Laura Zelligman, the award-winning Pentagon reporter at Politico, whose reporting on the military and defense industry has taken her all over the world, from the Middle East to Mongolia and to the Sahel and Africa. So Laura, over to you in our Atlantic Council studio. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Atlantic Council for having us. And thank you to you, Secretary General, for making this your first official stop on your trip. Um, so as was already said, a lot has changed this year since you've last been here. Elections, we've had a global pandemic. Um, and of course, you're here in Washington meeting with a new president that has a very different view of NATO than the last president. Um, so to kick it off, how do you talk to the American public about NATO now and in this moment in time and, and what NATO does? So fundamentally, my message is exactly the same, that the strong transatlantic bond, a strong NATO is good for Europe, but it's also good uh, for uh, the United States because we face so many challenges. Uh, uh, the global balance of power is, is shifting with the rise of China. We see uh, Russia continues its uh, aggressive uh, uh, actions. Uh, we see uh, international terrorism. We see more uh, sophisticated cyber attacks and all these challenges and many others. Uh, uh, we have to stand together. None of us can face them alone. We have to stand together in NATO uh, to deal with them. And, uh, and that's also good for the United States because it's a great advantage for the United States to have 29 friends and allies in NATO. Um, uh, so that's my message. <laughs> and that has been a message for years. The, 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 the important thing now is that we, we, are, we are at the pivotal moment uh, and, uh, and we will have a summit uh, uh, next week uh, with all the leaders uh, coming uh, to Brussels. And I'm very much looking forward to welcoming President Biden uh, to uh, to Brussels. And of course, it's it's also uh, great to have the opportunity to meet him today and then prepare for the upcoming summit uh, next week in Brussels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's going to be a very interesting summit. So I wanted to tease out a little bit 
uh, how you see NATO's relationship with the United States evolving uh, with this new administration. So can you talk a little bit about the challenges of the Trump era um, and obviously his public criticism of the alliance? And now in your dealing so far with President Biden and this upcoming meeting today, uh, how has that relationship changed and how do you see it evolving? Of course, there is no secret that there were some differences between allies uh, over the last uh, four uh, uh, years. Uh, at the same time, uh, we uh, all ensure that NATO remained a strong uh, alliance. Um, and, uh, and NATO is a strong alliance because it is in interest of all allies to, uh, to stand uh, together. And, uh, and for me, what matters now is to uh, uh, look into the future. How can we continue to make sure that NATO remains the most successful alliance in history? Uh, and the key to, to be that is to continue to change as the world is changing. And at the upcoming NATO summit, uh, we will agree uh, a forward-looking, ambitious agenda. Uh, we call it NATO 2030, which is exactly about how can NATO continue to change as the world is, is, is changing. Making sure that we are a unique platform for consultations among allies, uh, but also investing more in deterrence and defense, uh, and also addressing issues of resilience technology. So, so this is an ambitious, forward-looking agenda, and, uh, and uh, President Biden has expressed very strong support for NATO. He knows NATO very well. He, he has worked with NATO allies for many, many years. So his experience, his knowledge about the alliance is something I very much uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, sprinkle in questions throughout uh, from the audience with my own. And I see a couple here about Afghanistan. So I wanted to ask you about that. Obviously, that's one of the, the big issues facing NATO, facing NATO today, the, the withdrawal. Um, not only how to tackle the drawdown itself, but and ensure that Afghanistan does not become a safe haven for terrorists, um, but also some friction within the alliance. Um, we've heard world leaders like Ben Wallace talk about how they were unhappy with the US decision to withdraw. Uh, they weren't consulted ahead of time. So what are some of the thorny issues regarding the drawdown that NATO now must work through? Well, the drawdown is on track and we are uh, uh, so we're drawing our troops in a coordinated uh, way. Uh, and of course, uh, our main concern uh, now is to make sure that we are able to, uh, to, to maintain um, the, the safety for our troops as we uh, are leaving. At the same time, of course, uh, we are also looking into the future and uh, uh, and addressing uh, how can we uh, preserve hard-won gains uh, in Afghanistan. And therefore, we are ending our military uh, mission in Afghanistan, but we are uh, not uh, ending our support for the Afghans. We will continue to support them, partly with the NATO civilian presence, uh, which will provide an advice capacity building uh, for security institutions in Afghanistan. Uh, we will um, uh, uh, continue to fund the Afghan security forces, uh, and that's extremely important, and allies are ready to continue to do so. Uh, we will also um, look into how we can provide out-of-country training to train the Afghan uh, forces, especially their special operation forces uh, outside Afghanistan. And then we're also working on how we can we maintain some critical infrastructure, as for instance, the airport, uh, uh, to also support the presence of the broader international community, uh, diplomatic presence, but also, but also uh, uh, development aid and so on. So, so NATO will continue uh, to be committed to Afghanistan, but uh, in another way than uh, over the last two decades with a big military operation. So just to follow up on that, you talked about training. Is that is NATO going to continue to train the Afghan forces after the withdrawal, whether inside Afghanistan or abroad? We are looking into how we can provide training outside Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Our military mission, uh, the rest support mission in Afghanistan uh, will end. Uh, but of course, we can uh, train Afghan forces uh, in other countries. Uh, and we are looking into how we can provide that kind of support. And we'll have a civilian presence in, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, helping them with 
capacity building uh, and so on at the, also at the ministerial level or or for the different uh, the security institutions. And of course, just the fact that we are continuing to provide funding for Afghan security forces is a, a, also great importance. So so again, yes, we are ending our mission, but you have to remember that this is, in one way, this is a gradual development. Uh, not so many years ago, we had more than 100,000 troops in a big combat operation. Mm -hmm. Then we are gradually reduced, and by the beginning of this year, we, we were around 10,000. Uh, so uh, and and over these years we have been able to build the train Afghan security forces so they are now uh, responsible for security in their own country. The, the intention was never to stay there forever. Uh, and actually, there are, uh, um, we have to face the reality that is of course a lot of uncertainty. It's a very difficult situation in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, and and the decision to leave entails risks. Uh, but at the same time, we 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 leave in Afghanistan, which is very different. Than the Afghanistan we went into in 2001, uh, we have built uh, Afghan security forces from almost nothing. Uh, we are helped to promote economic and social progress. Uh, so uh, at some stage, Afghan had to take full responsibility for their own future, and that's what they're doing with continued support from NATO allies. It also add that we actually had the consultations on these issues over. Uh, uh, so the last uh, months until we made the decision, we had uh, several ministerial meetings. We had many meetings at the at the ambassadorial level uh, in Brussels. Uh, so we consulted, but of course it was a difficult decision uh, to end the military mission, which we had had for uh, almost two decades. Mm -hmm. And in terms of counterterrorism, the U.S. has said that they're going to be using the Gulf as the launching point for most of these operations. Now, do you think that that is a realistic uh, scenario for counterterrorism going forward? And do you think that what role can NATO play in making sure that these areas are monitored? So NATO and NATO allies are fighting terrorism in many countries without having big military missions on the ground in those countries. Uh, uh, and of course, we need to stay vigilant. We need to, uh, uh, to still be very focused on how can we fight international terrorism. Uh, NATO is a member of the Global Coalition to Defeat Daesh. Uh, uh, we all participate in, in that in different uh, ways. Uh, we have a training mission in, uh, in Iraq because I strongly believe that prevention is better than intervention. If we can train, train local forces, build local capacity so they can stabilize their own country. I'm absolutely certain that's the best way also to fight terrorism. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and NATO allies are working closely also in intelligence and other issues related to how we can support each other in the fight against uh, international terrorism. Mm -hmm. I want to turn now to Russia. <clears throat> and I see a couple questions here coming in from the audience on that. Um, we recently saw a massive buildup of Russian forces along the border with Ukraine. Some of these have left, but the majority are still there. So can you talk a little bit about how you see the Russia problem today, both the threat to Eastern Europe, but then also cyber attacks are increasing and also Vladimir Putin's support for oppressive governments like President Lukashenko in Belarus? So we have seen a pattern of behavior uh, uh, by Russia over the last years, uh, uh, where they have invested heavily in new modern military capabilities, conventional and nuclear. Uh, uh, they have uh, in intimidated neighbors. They have used military force against neighbors. Uh, in Georgia, in uh, Ukraine, illegally annexing Crimea and destabilizing eastern Ukraine. And then we have seen uh, that they have tried to uh, interfere or, or, or meddle into domestic political uh, processes in elections, cyber attacks, uh, um, uh, and different types of hybrid aggressive actions against uh, uh, different NATO allied uh, countries. So, so this pattern of aggressive actions using everything from uh, military tools to hybrid cyber uh, uh, tools is something which is, of course, a great concern for all NATO allies. Uh, what we do is partly to uh, provide support to partners, as for instance, Ukraine, political support, practical support, um, uh, or Georgia. Uh, uh, but we have also implement, implemented the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War, triggered by the aggressive actions uh, we saw in 2014 uh, when uh, Russia legally annexed uh, Crimea. Uh, so now we have four combat ready battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance. We never had that before. It's a com completely new thing. Uh, we have air policing, we have increased our uh, presence uh, in the Black Sea, in the Baltic Sea. 
um, and we have uh, significantly increase, increased the redness of forces. So all together, uh, all together, this is a very clear and strong response from NATO uh, uh, allies to uh, the aggressive actions uh, uh, by uh, by uh, by Russia. Uh, our approach to Russia is what we call dual track approach. We have to be strong, uh, firm, uh, but at the same time, we need to strive for uh, dialogue with Russia uh, because uh, Russia is our neighbor. We want we have to work on issues like arms control, mm -hmm. and we also have the NATO Russia Council, which is a platform to to, to sit down with Russia, and we have. We have a standing in, in invitation for for Russia to uh, to to participate in the meeting there to convene the NATO Russia Council again. So far, we are not they are not answered in a positive way, but we have some contact with them now on the possibility of convening in a meeting of the NATO Russia Council. Mm. There's one audience question here um, on Belarus, um, just asking about the airspace issue and, and Putin's comments that he would not rule out doing the same for flights flying over Russian airspace. What, what should NATO's response be to that? The, 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 the forced landing of a Ryanair plane flying from one NATO capital, Athens, to another NATO capital, um, uh, Vilnius, uh, is, uh, was outrageous. Uh, and it was a violation of fundamental basic norms and, uh, and, uh, and rules. Uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, it was not only uh, an outrageous attack because it, it put a lot of passengers in, in danger, uh, but of course they arrested uh, a journalist, uh, uh, Raman Protasevich and his uh, companion. So actually it was also an attack on freedom of speech, on independent media, and yet another example of how the Belarusian regime is cracking down on democratic protests uh, in, in the rush. So NATO allies... Um, uh, uh, agreed a very strong statement, strongly condemning this. We are calling for a for an uh, uh, impartial international investigation, and NATO allies, the United States, United Kingdom, the European Union, uh, have um, have imposed sanctions, and uh, I welcome that. Uh, this, of course, sends a message to anyone that that is considering to do something uh, similar. Uh, uh, we need to respect the rules and the norms we have for international. Uh, um, uh, air traffic, and that's important for for all countries. Mm -hmm. Turning now to China, um, as you know, the United States has increasingly focused on Beijing as its number one long-term security challenge, <clears throat> not just in the military realm, but also in areas like cyber attacks and telecommunications. So in what ways do the NATO allies share this perception of China, and in where do these views diverge? The rise of China matters for all NATO allies. And uh, at our summit in 2019, we actually made a statement, all the heads of state and government, that the rise of China poses some uh, opportunities because we can this trade, there are other uh, opportunities related to uh, to China. We need to engage with China on issues like arms control or, 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 or climate change. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, China is not an adversary. Having said that, NATO allies uh, also uh, see the fact that China will soon have the biggest economy in the world. They already have the second largest defense budget. They are investing uh, heavily in new modern capabilities. They have the biggest navy in the world. Uh, and, and they don't share our values. Uh, European allies, uh, and of course Canada, have again and again expressed <clears throat> deep concerns about the crackdown on democratic voices in, in Hong Kong, uh, uh, the persecution of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, minorities in, uh, in, in China, and the fact that they're using you know, um, uh, facial recognition, uh, uh, new disruptive technologies to, uh, to, to, to conduct surveillance of their own population in a way we had never seen before. Um, uh, and then, uh, uh, intimidating neighbors, um, uh, undermining freedom of navigation, uh, uh, and all of this. So we, NATO, uh, realize that the rise of China matters for our security. And the NATO 23rd agenda uh, covers many uh, different areas, but, but many of them are highly relevant for the consequences of, of the rise of China. Um, also, NATO has a platform for political consultations, reaching out to our Asia-Pacific uh, partners, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, 
but also, for instance, taking into account the fact that they are investing heavily or trying to control critical infrastructure in our countries. So we are, as part of the NATO 2030 agenda, working on how can we develop stronger guidelines for our resilience, telecommunications, uh, undersea cables, energy grids, uh, critical infrastructure, and also investing in and working uh, more on technology, uh, sharpening our technological edge. So NATO allies are responding and the NATO 2030 agenda is about how we can respond to a more competitive world. And that includes also the security consequence of the rise of China. So just a question here, uh, following up on the use of cyber capabilities by China and Russia. This is a question from the audience. Um, China and Russia's use of offensive cyber capabilities continues to disrupt both the public and private sector. What is NATO doing today to deter these cyber attacks and how can it coordinate its efforts effectively? So we see more frequent and we see more sophisticated uh, cyber attacks against uh, NATO allies, also the United States. Um, uh, this has led to uh, a significant strengthening of our uh, uh, cyber defenses and how we work together uh, on, uh, on cyber. Um, we have actually decided that a cyber attack can trigger Article 5, uh, it can trigger our collective defense uh, clause. Uh, we have uh, established cyber as an operational domain alongside uh, air, land, uh, sea. We now also have cyber as an operational military domain. We've established new cyber operation centers, uh, center at our headquarters, uh, uh, and we are sharing best practices. We are conducting big exercises. There's an ongoing exercise now where actually cyber is part of the exercise. Um, so, so we are doing more and more together uh, to help, to support, uh, to increase awareness. Uh, uh, at the end of the, of, of the day, of course, it's a national responsibility to to make sure you have uh, uh, good cyber defenses, but NATO allies are helping each other uh, and supporting each other. And we're also, of course, doing a lot to protect our own networks. Mm. Just to follow up really quickly on that, you said a cyber attack can now trigger Article 5. Is that a major change from in the past? And what, when when did you decide this? Why has it been put into practice We did that, uh, we did that some years ago, mm -hmm. but, but of course, it, it, it also, it, in a way, it sends a message that a kinetic attack uh, can, of course, cause a lot of damage, mm -hmm. but so it can also a cyber attack. So in a way, it's, it doesn't matter whether it's a kinetic attack or a cyber attack, we will mm -hmm. uh, assess as allies uh, when it meets the threshold for, uh, for uh, uh, also triggering Article 5. And that sends a message that, of course, we, we regard cyber attacks as, as serious as any other kinds of attacks. Um, uh, then, of course, we can respond in cyber, but we can also respond mm. uh, with other means. That's up, uh, for us to decide. I think also it's important to, uh, to make sure that allies come together and call out bad behavior also in, in cyberspace when we see that. Uh, and the NATO allies have, you know, we have seen attempts to, to as well, the cyber attacks on the German Bundestag. We had uh, seen solar wind. We have seen different uh, cyber attacks. We have seen the attack on the OPCW, the, the Organization for Prohibition of uh, Chemical Weapons. Um, um, so we need to call out bad behavior when we see it. That's also a way to, uh, to at least increase the threshold and and uh, and uh, impose some costs. Uh, on Russia or other countries when they um, are responsible for cyber attacks. Mm. I want to turn now to climate change. Uh, President Biden has made addressing <coughs> climate change a key <coughs> priority for his administration. And you yourself, uh, I believe, are a former UN envoy on climate change. Um, so what role does an alliance like NATO have in addressing and mitigating climate change? And why is this such an important task for the alliance? First of all, I think we have to... <coughs> recognize and, and realize that uh, uh, climate change matters for our security because uh, climate change is a crisis multiplier. Uh, with more uh, competition, it will lead to more competition for scarce resources as water, land. It will force a million of people uh, to move, uh, more uh, migration. And of course, that affects our security. Um, so therefore, it matters for NATO. Uh, uh, and NATO will, of course, never be the main platform for addressing uh, uh, climate change, but NATO should be the main platform for addressing the security consequences of climate change. And what we need to do is, uh, first of all, uh, to set the gold standard when it comes to fully assess, understand the link between uh, global warming and, and our security. 
second, we need to adapt our military operations uh, because with rising sea levels, it will affect a lot of um, military infrastructure. Of course, naval bases, uh, but also with more extreme weather, heat waves, it will affect the way we conduct military operations, uh, uniforms, equipment. We have soldiers in Iraq, and there were several days with more than 40 degrees Celsius. And of course, how they do their work uh, uh, will be uh, implemented or will, will, will be affected by uh, extreme uh, weather conditions. Um, uh, melting uh, ice in the Arctic will also matter. So, changing uh, weather, more extreme weather. Uh, will matter for how we do military operations, what kind of equipment, what kind of uniforms, uh, or what kind of challenges we will face. And thirdly, um, uh, NATO allies uh, uh, more and more of them now commit to uh, net zero emissions, meaning that we also need to reduce emissions from uh, military operations. Uh, we need to find ways of uh, reconciling the need for operational effectiveness with uh, reduced emissions. And we are investing in technology. We have different programs for 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 also making sure that we have military uh, equipment uh, vehicles uh, which are uh, emitting less uh, but also then uh, are effective uh, military uh, also uh, tools and equipment so a related question here from the audience um on the arctic what do you make of recent developments related related to arctic security particularly russia's militarization of the region China's growing interest, and of course, like we talked about, the impact of China, climate change opening the region up. The Arctic region has always been important for NATO. We have uh, five uh, NATO allies, which are Arctic uh, nations, uh, uh, and NATO has always been in the Arctic. Um, uh, but uh, the melting of the ice combined with increased uh, Russian military presence, they're reopening some old bases from the Cold War, uh, and increased uh, Chinese interest and presence, of course, just increases the importance of the Arctic. Uh, also with the potential new sea routes along uh, also the, the, the Northeast sea route from, 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 from Europe uh, to Asia. Uh, and all of this matters for our security. So therefore, uh, NATO is also uh, increasing uh, its focus and its presence uh, in, in the Arctic. Um, NATO allies, including the Arctic NATO allies, are investing in new capabilities as uh, as uh, as uh, so everything from from maritime patrol aircrafts to submarines and and all the other equipment and uh, and capabilities we need to to make sure that we continue uh, to um, show the necessary presence uh, in the high north. So we're quickly running out of time, but I want to squeeze in one more uh, from the audience. Uh, what can you do to convince more European allies to spend 2% of GDP on defense? <clears throat> First and foremost, to remind them of that this is in the interest of European allies and also Canada to invest more in our security because um, when tensions went down after the end of the Cold War, uh, NATO allies uh, reduced defense spending. Uh, but if we are reducing defense spending when tensions are going down, you have to increase when tensions are going up, as they do now. Um, uh, and therefore, we made a decision uh, at our NATO summit in 2014 uh, uh, that those allies spending less than 2% of GDP uh, should uh, uh, increase. And the good news is that that's exactly what the European allies and Canada have done over the last year, since 2014. Um, we are now seven consecutive years of increased defense spending across Europe and Canada. Uh, they have added significantly to their defense budgets. Back in 2014, it was only three allies that spent 2% of GDP on defense. Now it's uh, uh, 10 allies. And also those allies are not yet at 2%. At, at, at uh, the majority have plans in place to meet the 2% guideline, and, uh, and they also increased significantly. Um, so. So uh, we still have some work to do. We, we, we still need to invest more in defense. Uh, and again, part of the NATO 2030 agenda is to make sure that we continue to invest, that we also invest more together because that's a force multiplier. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a way not only to spend more, but also better that we spend through, uh, through NATO together. Uh, but I'm optimistic because I've seen a commitment by European allies to, to live, uh, live up to the decision we made together in 2014. 
And as far as the United States is concerned and the Biden administration in particular, we saw a defense budget come out recently that only had a very slight increase for defense. So do you see the Biden administration as a partner that you can rely on to try to increase the defense spending in NATO? The Biden administration, first of all, is a very strong supporter of NATO. Uh, second, the United States uh, spends much more than 2% of GDP on defense. It goes a bit up and down, but I mean, the, the reality is that the United States uh, invests uh, heavily in defense. I welcome that. It is not for me to decide or, or give us any specific advice on the exact uh, amount, as long as the United States is by far the lead nation when it comes to uh, defense capabilities and defense spending in our alliance. Uh, so I'm confident that the United States will continue uh, to invest uh, and also invest in NATO because it's good for strong NATO is good for Europe, but it's also very good for the United States and even more so uh, because the uh, United States is, of course, concerned about the security consequences of uh, the rise of China and, and compared to China, it's very good to have friends uh, in NATO. <laughs> well, I think we're about out of time, but thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Um, and thank you so much to our audience for joining joining us, joining the Atlantic Council. And uh, I hope you can join for the next program, which features the president of the Republic of Kosovo. And that's this Wednesday, June 9th at 8.30 a.m. Thank you. Thank you.